have the family back together. And we'll go through some announcements real quick. Linda prepared a great bulletin. So pick up, if you need a bulletin, Mark is grabbing a whole handful. Raise your hand, and Mark will place a bulletin in your hand. Up here, Mark. Phyllis needs one. Anyone else need one of these? Okay. Uh, real quickly, we'll jump through these uh, announcements. Today is Photo Sunday, as you see there in the uh, bulletin. At, immediately after our worship service is over, we're going to, don't wander off, stay here in the sanctuary, and we're going to take a picture of everyone across the front of the sanctuary that it will be used online during our broadcast. Remember the one that's there now? Have you seen it? It's about 73 years old. So, uh, so if you'll stay in here, uh, it'll only take a few minutes to take a picture. We've got a whole bunch of new folks, a whole bunch of new faces, and that'll go uh, online and on our Facebook post. Also, uh, no men's breakfast in August because of the ladies' conference on the 20, Friday the 26th and the 27th. I am going to start... With Rob, I'll just hand that to Rob. That is a sign-up sheet for men that will uh, that are needed to help serve food uh, during the conference. Uh, the ladies will be catered to and served, and uh, we need five men for the first day of the conference for the 26th. Is that right, Heidi? Yeah, Friday night dinner, dinner on the 26th, and also uh, lunch on the 27th. So sign, sign up for that if you can be here. Uh, you don't need a tuxedo, but it would look really cool. Okay, so. All right. Um, moving our Bible study on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall is a staple and is really getting heavy. I like it. Uh, in Genesis. And uh, please join us for that. If you haven't been to the Bible study and show up, and man, good stuff there. Okay, um, I have some other um, announcements. Oh, I forgot. In case you're wondering, not only is today the day that the Lord hath made, but it is National Creamsicle Day. Oh, no, I see everyone going, yeah. All right. So, you know what to do to celebrate that, right? Yep. Shake your head, yes. Uh, it's a, another interesting twist is it's National Navajo Code Talkers Day. Gary, Gary Cressy's shaking. A lot of us know what that means. During World War II, the United States recruited Navajo uh, code talkers to transmit things in Navajo so that the enemy could not uh, pull that down and interpret it and know what we were doing. Actually, there was a movie made about that. Okay, so that's done. Uh, Thursday, this coming Thursday at 0730 in the morning, we're going to meet here at the church to attack the weeds. And uh, they're back. I mean, we've prayed for rain. God gave us rain, right? Yes. And did we need it? Uh, but along with rain comes grass, weeds, and all manner of green things. So we're going to show up with lawnmowers and weed eaters at 7.30 Thursday morning. Should be done probably no later than 8 or 9 that night. So you know, bring a lunch um, and prepare to work. Okay. Uh, I think that's... Da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, any announcements? that I missed that are, okay, Mark, here we go. Um, about the women's conference, the deadline to sign up, give or take, is the 17th. That way the guys know how much food to prepare. And uh, payment needs to be either put in the slot or handed to myself um, or Pastor Tom. Um, by next Sunday, the 21st. Okay, good, thank you. And if you're wondering if you're writing a check for that down in the memo field, 
Please Write Women's Conference, so Shirley will know how to allocate that money. Um, any other announcements that we need to make? No. Then we'll move to prayer requests and praises. Would you like to offer a praise for something that's going on in your life or something you've seen or a prayer request? I can tell you um, up front that I have one. Um, you know our brother Dan Griffiths, Dan and Robin. Um, Dan's brother is and family is in need of prayer right now. Dan's brother is a believer and is uh, preparing to go to his heavenly reward. It's up in Colorado, so keep Dan and Robin and the Griffith family in your prayers. Mark. Glad to, good to have you back. You bet. Any Steve. other? Oh, Jenny. Yeah, um, Luke, Luke and Stacy White are asking for prayer for a friend who is blessed with a new kidney. He had been waiting for this um, for years, but he's developed a blood clot, and he's having to go back in for surgery to remove the blood clot. Okay. Nancy, do you have that? Okay. Karen's got a request or praise. It's a prayer request for Jeff Barbie, whose wife, Robin Reisbeck, that some of you may know, she taught music at the high school. She passed away last week after a very long struggle. And so just prayers for Jeff to get him through this and to draw him closer to Jesus. Robert Wood has one, Mark. Yes, we're happy to have Grayson with us today, and uh, we just want the continued prayers that all that goes, goes as planned. Um, he'll be going back right now Tuesday, but we should have him permanent soon. But uh, just keep that all in your prayers so that it goes uh, according to God's will. Yes. So, Amen. Say hi, Grayson. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. What a precious little guy. I met Jason in the hallway. Uh, thank you. <laughs> met him in the hallway, and uh, I was coming one way, and he's coming at me, and I was just going to bend down and, and shake hands. And that's how he greets folks. Okay, thank you, Robert. Any other? Oops. Franny. Um, I prayed, I think, on Tuesday at prayer for my sister. She had a serious stroke. And I'll have to tell you, it's a miracle. She is doing so well. I had a chance to share Jesus with my brother-in-law. They're very devout Catholics. And um, I just praise the Lord. He called me this morning here, actually. He's so excited she's doing it. So prayer works. And this is just a wonderful, wonderful answer. Thank you. Thanks, Franny. Any other prayer requests or praises? Back here, Skip again. Oh, Jenny. Here again. Okay, Stacy Griffith. Uh, Stacy White just updated on her uncle John. He passed away this morning, uh, and so she's asking prayer for his two daughters and for her grandmother. Okay, got it. We'll cover them in prayer. And who else had one? Hey. Um, just praises for Fred's and my trip down to Tucson to the memorial for our friend that had passed away. We were able to interact with a lot of people in the biker, biker community, and uh, I think we were a blessing to Scott, um, her boyfriend. Um, and we also got to go to church with a bunch of our old friends uh, at Calvary Chapel down there. So it was a great trip. Thanks, Denise. Um, I still have a couple unspoken requests that I appreciate your prayer uh, for. So, uh. I have an aunt in South Carolina that just lost another brother, and that's four brothers, three brothers in four years. So keep their family in your prayers. Will do, Diane. Any other prayers, requests, or praises? Mary's got one. I just want to praise the Lord for 
all of the prayers that God has answered that were lifted up from Nutrioso Bible Church. We have seen miracles galore. We have seen all kinds of answers to prayer. And I just want to praise God that he hears us and answers prayer. Not always like I want it, but it's always best. Thanks, Mary. Pastor? I also have a family member who called and asked if we would lift up in prayer a situation in their family right now. Okay. Nancy, did you get that one? Okay. Any other prayer requests? Praises? John, are you saying you have one? or? Oh, okay. Okay, did that make it through? Did that make it through the congregation? Okay, Mark, if you would give that mic to Fred. Oh, okay, John. I just want to say that we're going to um, actually cook for the ladies. And the reason that I want to say that is because um, it won't be as good as Subway, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so um, pray for them because they have to eat my cooking. Thanks for the war uh, thanks for the information. Okay, would you take that over to Fred, and Fred is going to lead us in our morning prayer. Thank you, Father God, for saving us from the way we used to be and making us the new creation that you have called us to be. We thank you for all the praises we offer to glorify you because of what you've already done. We now lift those who are sick and the families of those who have passed so that you would continue to comfort and create new miracles as you have each and every day. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and Sing this old hymn with us. Jesus saves. It's also known as we have heard the joyful sound. We, we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shall salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest graves. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Christ is everything. Amen. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. 
our beds every Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me everything I need is in you everything I need Christ my all in all the joy of my salvation and this hope will never fail heaven is our hope through every storm my soul will sing Jesus is here to guide me the glory Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me everything I need is in you everything I need oh yeah No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. That's right now. Ah, oh, he's awesome. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken now. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our Praise to you all of thee. Oh, yes, Lord God. We give you all our praise. You give light. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken and now. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise in your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Shout your praise 
Our hearts will cry, these boats will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these boats will sing Great are you, Lord you, Lord God. What an awesome day. What an awesome day. This is called There Was Jesus. Every time I try to make it on my own. Every time I try to stand, I start to fall And all of these lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus And the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. And the waiting, and the searching, and the healing, and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it, there was Jesus. Well, this man who needs an amazing kind of grace, forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the waiting, and the searching, and the healing, and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus in the mountains, in the valleys. There was Jesus in the shadows of the alleys there was jesus in the fire and the flood there was jesus always is and always was oh, 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 oh. no i never walk alone never you walk are always alone. there in the waiting in the searching in the healing and the hurting like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every man, every, minute, every moment every moment, where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus There was Jesus There was Jesus There was Jesus 
Wow. The song was great. The music was great, but the message, it's true. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. You know, I was thinking about conversations I've had with people over the years about their feeling of what it means to be a Christian and I've heard so many people express so many views of what they thought it meant to come to Jesus to be saved. I've had some people who said that once I was saved, it was a matter of becoming perfect. That if I'm a Christian, I should become perfect. Or even before I become a Christian, I'll come to Jesus once I'm good enough. But this is not a scorecard relationship. On the other hand, I've had people say that, well, for me, the only thing I'm interested in is not going to the smoking section of eternity. <laughs> and basically, what faith is, is simply a fire insurance policy or something that I throw in the drawer, live my life however I want to, and when my last day comes, I open up the drawer and say, I got one. And I'm saying, none of this is right. What we're looking at in our relationship with God is not a club that we are voted into or a perfection that we somehow achieve in this life. It is a relationship. A relationship with the God of all creation, but also to be born into a family. And you don't get voted into a family as much as maybe sometimes we wish we could. We are born into that family, and we have our place there. Over the next few Sundays, I would like to share what that relationship should look like. We start out in this world with three stages in our Christian walk. If we are truly born again, we will see three stations in life. We start out with justification. We go to sanctification. And then when we live this life and leave it in Christ, we are glorified glorification. That should be our legacy. That should be what is true to us. Now, I'm going to ask if you will, bow with me, and let's speak to the one who is not only our creator, but who is our Father, if we are in Christ. Father, this morning, I ask in the name of Jesus that you will open our hearts, that we won't be bulldozed by trying to always be perfect and become disappointed, but that we would understand what it means to grow and to mature, to be sanctified, set apart for a holy purpose in you. Father, we want this to be a meaningful, a joyful relationship, not a perfectionistic impossibility. So be with us, Father, and let us look at your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Paul says that when you and I are born again, it's very similar to what our human life is. It is a series of stages, correct? We start out with what we call prenatal stage. We are born we are conceived. And before we ever enter this room, life begins right up to them from conception to the morn that we are literally born into this world. And then after we 
are born, we go through what? Childhood and adolescence. And we go to adulthood. And eventually, some of us know, senior citizenship. (laughs) Now, I'm not there yet, but they tell me about it. (laughs) But these are all stages of life that if we're here, we progress through. But here's the question I ask. Did you ever get through one of the stages of your physical life without stumbling, without making a mistake, without being less than you wish that you were? With maturation comes mistakes, correct? And we can either let those mistakes destroy us or we can get up and say, I learned from that, let's move forward. But again, the Christian walk is much like the same thing. When we are born again, we start a life, set aside, God comes within our heart, we grow, we mature, and eventually we're glorified. But here's the question I have for you. Those of you who have been in the faith for many years, after you were born again, did you stop making mistakes? Have you ever fallen flat on your face even after saying, Jesus, you are my Lord. I will tell you now, if you are saying no, we need to have a talk about truth. (laughs) Because I know what the human experience is, and I know what the Bible says. The Bible says that we will continue to grow if we are truly in Christ. Listen to what Paul says. This should be our experience in 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says, though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed day by day. You know, I look in the mirror and I look at the high school pictures of just a couple of years ago, and I see a lot of changes, correct? This body is deteriorating, just like Paul says, just as our bodies are dying, The arteries are getting a little bit more clogged. The wrinkles are coming a little bit more often than we like to see in the mirror. The arthritis is giving us more and more trouble. That is the condition of our physical bodies. But Paul says, even though our outward bodies are deteriorating, what should be happening to our inward spirit? We should be growing day by day. Now, For us to begin maturation, we first have to be born again. And that's what I talked about last week. But I want to hit on that for just a second before we go any further. I declared a biblical truth last week. That if we want to gain heaven, there is no alternative path than this. We must be born again. That is not an option. That's not one of three or four paths to God. If we want to see heaven, if we want to be right with God, we must be born again. It doesn't matter, as I said last week, how many worship services you've attended. It doesn't matter how much money you put in the collection plate. It doesn't matter how many theological schools or seminaries you've attended or how many Sunday school classes that you've taught. It doesn't matter whether your mom and dad and all of your family are saved and sanctified. There is no family plan. If you want to go to heaven, this is step number one. You have to be born again. Jesus said it very plainly. And it's so critical that we hold on this truth that Jesus said. John 3, 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot do what? See the kingdom of God. It didn't say you may not. He didn't say this is one of the options. He said, unless you are born again, unless I am born again, we will not see the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say a little bit further in John 3, 5, I assure you, again, listen to the emphasis on this. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the Spirit. 
Now, there are some people I know argue what water and spirit means here, but I'm going to show you my reason for believing what I do. I believe that this has to do with the symbolism of baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Until my old nature is dead, nothing new can be born. And what does baptism symbolize? It symbolizes the truth of an inward reality. I am dead, and just like Christ went into the grave and arose again, that's what I'm asking. I am joining in that with him. When I went into baptism, I was associating with what had already had in faith, that I, the old man is dead, and a new man has been resurrected, but not just resurrected to continue on to live life like I did in the past, but I have a new presence within my life that gives me the ability to maybe live differently than I did before I needed this. Take a look at Romans 6, 4. He said, well, Tom, where do you get that? I think all of our answers should come from one place. The Bible is its own best commentary, right? You can get a lot of pastors and a lot of people to write articles, but we are fallible. The Word of God is not fallible, and the best commentary we can have on any Bible passage is the Word itself. And this is what Paul says in Romans 6, 4. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Water. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. When God calls to us, before we have heard his call, we are dead. And I've looked at a lot of dead bodies over the years. It was just part of life and part of what I do. I've been by the side of many dead bodies. And I can speak to them and I can holler at them and I can poke them and I can prod them and they cannot respond. But when the grace of God enables me to see myself for who I am, what I am, he gives me the choice then, Tom, do you want to remain that way or would you like to start over and have life anew? Make a choice. And if I make the choice, to say, Lord, I want my old life taken care of because of what you did on the cross. I want to have that man buried. I want to be just as if I had never sinned once in my life. When I come out of that grave, what happens? It's as if I had no past. I only have a future. And we can either accept that offer of forgiveness, or we can say, don't really care, don't really need it, God. Thank you very much. I'm going to go on living life the way I want. But here's the reality of what that decision means. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, you will perish also unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. That's a pretty blunt statement, but it's a true statement. When we are faced with our sins, we have an option. We can either accept it or reject it. But Jesus, not Tom, Jesus said in so many other passages too, that once we are faced with who and what we are, we can either continue down the path and say, I don't care, or I can repent, allow God to give me a new life, start over, and develop that new relationship with him. We must be born again to become citizens of the land and we become infants desiring fresh life. But here's my question. Once I am made anew, once I am born again, what comes after that? Well, we enter a new phase of our life. We are a new creature and now we have to go through what? We have to go through growth. We have to go through maturation. And for the rest of our life, we will grow as spiritual children. We will mature. But here's the thing. When you were a baby, did you not mess your britches at times? I did. And I had a lot of kids. And I don't like dirty diapers, but the truth of the matter is, with a newborn infant comes messy diapers. That's our truth too. When we are born again, we are not born perfect, 
but we mess our diapers. And like responsible adults, we may want to do the right thing always, but what's the reality? We make a mess out of our lives at times. We make mistakes, and we need to come to that. And as long as we live in this life, as long as we remain here in these bodies, here's the reality. You and I are going to make mistakes, and if you expect perfection, you've got a sad awakening coming. Take a look at what the Apostle Paul talks about in his own experience. Philippians 3.12 Paul talks about his walk and his desire to receive perfection someday. In Philippians 3.12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already received perfection. You hear what he's saying? Paul's writing this after he's been a Christian for a long time, and he says, I'm still trying to develop into Christ would have me be, but I'm not perfect yet. But even though I'm not perfect, and even though I realize this, I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ first possessed me. Paul wants each of us to understand something. He wants the Philippian readers to understand something. He said, I'm born again. I'm a believer. I'm one of God's children. I'm an apostle. But here's the truth. Even though I'm saved and I am sanctified, I have not yet achieved perfection in this life. I have not arrived, and here's the truth. I still battle sin and my old sin nature. Take a look at what he says in Romans 7, because this is so important to us. This is Paul confessing who he was and what he dealt with in life. In Romans 7, 21, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Oh, can I feel that one? I love God's law. I love it with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And look at verse 24. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and by death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, what remains in this body, I'm going to paraphrase, I still mess up. Do you mess up? You mess up? Does that mean we quit? Does that mean we throw in the towel? How many of you can identify with what Paul's frustration is right now? How many of you can do it? I passionately love God. I passionately love God. I'm born again, but I struggle with getting it right. Can you identify with that? I want to please God. I want to obey his law. I really, in my heart, want to do what's right. But what do I always do? Or oftentimes, I do the opposite thing. The thing that I don't want to do, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I don't want to do the wrong thing, but I keep struggling within myself. That's what Paul was going through, and he had been a believer for decades. He said, I'm still trying to achieve perfection, but here's reality. Now, does that sound like you at times? Does it sound like somebody you know at times? What did Paul say? Here's where I'm at in this world, Philippians. I'm tired of not being able to achieve perfection, therefore I'm throwing in the towel, I'm quitting, I'm going home. Is that what Paul says? No, he says, I press on, I will not give up, I will live in victory. But not a victory from him simply pulling up his bootstraps, but victory in what? 
in his relationship of the one who lives in him. He recognized who he was and what he was. He knew that he was going to make mistakes at times, but he did not quit. Look at Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13. He says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it. Achieved what? I've not achieved perfection. I'm not a perfect man. But I focus on this one thing. I forget the past, and I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. What is he looking for? He has been justified. He has no past. He is being sanctified. He's getting more and more mature. But what is he finally seeking for? Glorification. The day when it all comes together and he doesn't fight the battle that we fight right now. He gets the prize. So here's the question to you. What is the secret to Paul's victory over sin? What's his secret? How can he deal with the sins that will come up with our life? For Paul, when the Holy Spirit convicts him of sin, he owns it. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't run away from it. He owns it. Do we own our sins? Or do we say, well, it's somebody else's fault or whatever? We own it. He confesses it. He seeks forgiveness. And he asks the Holy Spirit to give him the wisdom and the strength to avoid making the same mistake in the future. You know, the Apostle John says basically the same thing. I'd like to have you look at one other passage. 1 John 1.8. Now, John is writing this letter at a later time in his life also. He's been saved and sanctified for a lot of years. But listen what he says is his foundation. If we claim that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and are not living in the truth. Do you hear what he just said? John, saved, sanctified, the disciple that Jesus loved, says, I still, if we say that we are without sin. He's putting himself right in that category. He's saying that if we say that we are without sin, we are fooling ourselves and we are not living in what? The truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, and he will cleanse us from all of the things that we have done wrong. But if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. John and Paul are saying the same thing. If you're expecting to be perfect in this life and never make a mistake. You are lying about the truth. You're lying about yourself and you need a reality check. Well, Tom, are you simply saying that we're like a lot of people saying, well, no one's perfect, so I'm not going to care. That's the hinge here. A person who really is born again cares when they make a mistake. They care when they make a mistake. When they make a mistake, they just don't say, sorry about that, do better next time. It bothers them. It causes them to ache with inside. They don't want to be there. But what do we do with it? We take it to the one who can cleanse us. We confess what we've done. We go to the one, and you know what? He is just, and he will forgive us. But I'd like to share one last thought with you before we close this morning. Take a look at Philippians 3.13. Paul says, when I make the mis mistake,
in the rear view mirror, one of two glasses I want you to think about. The little tiny rear view mirror and the great windshield in front. If you always spent your time looking in that rear view mirror, what would you do? You'd total yourself out. I've even tried that as an adult in walking. I'm looking behind me, and how far do we get? When we're always looking behind, what do we do? We crash and burn. But where should we be putting the majority of our time? Looking out that great big windshield in the front. That's where we should be putting a majority of our time, and that is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Our attention needs to be on where God is taking us, not what he's forgiven us for. Reference point, yes, but future is there. Repent of your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. Ask the Holy Spirit to deal with those mistakes. They are out of the way. They're in the past. But once those mistakes are dealt with, press on to the prize. That's where our focus needs to be. That's where victory is at. And it's not just because we positive image. It's because the Holy Spirit is there saying, Tom, you remember that mistake you made last time? Don't worry about it. We got this for the future. You're getting better. And like a good coach, we're in this together. Press on to the day until you leave this body and you truly can become perfect. But that's what awaits us. So here's my question to you as we dismiss. As we get ready to sing the song. Where are you at in your walk with Christ? Is your past haunting you? Or is it something that you can simply use as a reference point and that God has forgiven and he does not hold against us at all? Once God forgives us, it's a done deal. But the next thing is, are you a person who says, I just can't do this and I'm going to give up? Or are you a person who says, I've made my mistakes, but in Christ, I'm going to make it to the end of the race? Bow with me, if you will, right now. Father, this morning, we're going to start talking about sanctification. And I wanted to start here right now because I've had so many people over the years say, Tom, I'm so frustrated. I've been a Christian, and I still make mistakes. Father, that's a lie of the enemy. As long as we live in this body, we will make mistakes. Help us to feel pain when we make those mistakes. Help us to care, but help us to come to you to be forgiven. To be forgiven so that we can have our past taken forward and that our entire attention can be on where we are going in you. Help us to live victoriously, not with an anchor dragging behind us In Jesus' name, amen. If you in any way are being spoken to by God this morning and we can help you, please come forward as we stand and sing the song selected. Please stand. Have you failed in your plan of your storm-tossed life? Place your hand in the nail's garden. Are you weary and worn from its toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail's garden. Place your hand in the nail's garden. Place your hand in the nail's garden. He will keep to the end, he's your dearest friend. Place your hand in the nail's garden. Is your soul burdened down with its load of sin? Place your hand in the nail's garden. Throw your heart open wide, let the Savior inside, place your hand in the nail's garden, 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 place your hand in the
Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. He will keep to the end. He's your dearest friend. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. in our lives at times, right? And it's always good to have a friend there. This is the best friend we're going to find. Yeah. Let's do a final song. That's right. And come on, I'm, put your hands together. Put them together now. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. I'll praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all of my life. With all of my strength. is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, have my strength, is in you, have my hope, is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, it's in you.